Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, C3.ai Digital Transformation Institute Colloquium. And uh, before we uh, turn it over to our speaker, let me just tell you a few words about the Institute. The Institute's mission is to really develop the science of digital transformation. Not a day goes by without your uh, lot of headlines in the paper talking about how COVID is really accelerating the digital transformation of societal systems. And that's really the effect of AI, machine learning, and cloud computing in transforming how we live. And so the purpose of our institute is to develop the scientific underpinnings of this digital transformation. It's uh, funded largely by C3.ai and Microsoft. There are also a list of industry partners. Uh, it's co-led by Berkeley and Illinois, but, uh, and the other partners are CMU, MIT, Princeton, University of Chicago, and Stanford, two national labs. But I have to say the list of universities goes beyond this sort of core group and includes several universities that have partnered with us, including Johns Hopkins, which is, uh, who's represented today. So this colloquium, by the way, has, I think we've had a speaker every single day, every single Thursday afternoon this fall. Uh, you are in for a treat today, and the next three are all actually fantastic. Nancy Amato, the chair of computer science at the University of Illinois is gonna be talking about bioinformatics and uh, she's gonna be talking about lessons learned from SARS and MERS and what we do about COVID-19 and that's a really hot topic in the news. Of course, her title is, unless you look at her title, uh, Stefana Parasco and Corina Tarnita from the Department of Architecture at Princeton will talk about how architects bring social distancing to light, how do you do, how do you use light patterns to encourage it. And Karen Chapel from our, uh, our own department, chair of our department of urban planning will talk about how this pandemic and the poverty induced by it is really caused or is causing all kinds of social havoc in terms of eviction and inequality. And that is December 10th. We'll take a break and we will restart January 7th. So January 7th is the first Thursday in, uh, uh, in, in January and we'll be going every Thursday from then. So uh, the format of this is a 40 minute presentation. You can post questions, upvote them, all of that. And Camille, who is on the, we will moderate them and we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. But let me tell you about today's colloquium and you are in for a treat and judging from the large number of you that have dialed in, it is certainly hot, hot, hot topic. Mathematics of Deep Learning, and uh, we are fortunate to have a great speaker today. Rene Vidal, let me say a few words about him. He is the Herschel Sater Professor of Bioengineering and uh, many other departments, I think, which are not listed on the slide, in, uh, in, and, and the director of a new institute for the mathematics of data science at Hopkins. He's an Amazon scholar, chief scientist at Norse, and the associate editor-in-chief of transactions and pattern analysis and machine intelligence. And his work really focuses on the underpinnings, the scientific underpinnings of deep learning and its applications to computer vision and biomedical data science. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Bio Biomedical Engineers, an IEEE Faro Pattern Society of Pattern Recognition Fellows, and a Sloan Fellow. He has received, he's already in his uh, career so far received a huge number of uh, distinguished awards, including the Agarwal Prize for Computer Vision, the Donna Bear Faculty Award, NSF, ONR, and several best paper awards, really quote, quite a large number. One thing that's not on this slide, which I want to tell you is, you know, he is the principal investigator and the lead of a recently awarded NSF Simons Institute project on the mathematics of deep learning. And he and Professor Ma actually ran a wonderful workshop about two weeks ago, which should, uh, on uh, really the uh, mathematics of deep learning. And that was really toward the force 
And if that was any indication, I think you're in for a treat today to listen to Rene Vidal. Uh, by the way, the materials from that workshop are a repository on the website, uh, either already are or in the act of being curated to be a repository there. So without further ado, let me welcome Rene. So Rene, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Shankar. It's uh, really a great pleasure to be uh, speaking today at Berkeley. Uh, what you forgot to mention is that Berkeley is my alma mater. And so it's always a great pleasure to be back home, uh, even if this time is remotely. I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, Deep networks have been around uh, for much longer than many of our young students think. Uh, in fact, the first neural networks uh, were invented in the 1940s. And what is very interesting is they've got uh, three lives. Uh, they've gone through periods of hype where everybody thought that they would really solve the machine intelligence problem. And also through periods of uh, neural winters, where it was uh, not really a great idea, not uh, well looked upon to actually work in uh, neural networks. Um, in particular, the first era was really neural networks with maybe a single neuron or perceptron. They were binary. And uh, they were the first training algorithms developed in the 1960s, the so-called Adeline. Uh, but during the 70s, it was not cool to work on neural networks. One of the reasons was theoretical. Uh, the inability of uh, neural networks to uh, approximate the so-called XOR function, in, which was the basis of neural circuits at the time. And this was pointed out in a, in a paper by Minsky and Papert uh, in the early uh, 1970s. Then there was the second wave where they became again really successful. The first applications to computer vision, digit recognition in particular, the first applications in speech came about. And it was all driven by having a little bit more data, making the networks bigger, real value, but primarily also by the invention of the backpropagation algorithm in 1982. Uh, but again, uh, at the end of the century, uh, it was not a good idea to, to work on them. In fact, uh, personally, I have an anecdote. When I joined Berkeley in 1998, I was very interested in areas such as the neural networks and, and, and fuzzy logic was another hot topic at the time. But I quickly realized that no one uh, wanted to work on it. And we were advised that it was not a good idea at all. Why? What happened? What, what was the issue at the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s? So again, neural networks uh, were successful, but we didn't understand really what they were doing. Uh, by and large, it's always been the case that they're black boxes, that training them is a little bit of a mystery why they work. And that was the case already uh, at the end of the century. So in particular, uh, the alternative was really to use support vector machines. And that motivated that most of the 2000s in computer vision was let's come up with our best handcrafted features that we can extract from images, audio, uh, or speech. And then let's feed them to a classifier and let's train linear classifiers that we can understand. There are convex problems, we can train them, we can understand when and why they work. And as you know, everything changed in 1912. Um, uh, sorry, 2012, uh, with the uh, making the networks deeper and the improvement of 10% in the ImageNet data set in computer vision. So this was the largest data set in computer vision at the time. By and large, there had been several years of research uh, on handcrafted features plus linear or kernel SVMs. And the best that one could do was on the order of 30%. So that improvement of 10% was a big uh, change. And the same has happened pretty much in all areas of AI ever since. Uh, this is a, a plot about the uh, error uh, in speech on the top right. And you can see also that there was a big dip ever since 2012 onwards. And I guess you all know, today uh, we have deep learning everywhere from Siri uh, doing speech recognition, from Amazon uh, automatic recognition in supermarkets to uh, self-driving cars. 
So the goal of this talk is to uh, understand why, not maybe not to understand why, but at least to ask the question of why and whether we can begin to get closer to understand what's happened. So back in 2014, where people began working uh, or reworking again on the math of deep learning, uh, sort of the answers that would be given as to why this improvement in performance, the first answer was, uh, well, features. Features are learned rather than handcrafted. As I just mentioned, much of the 2000s in computer vision was let's come up with really great features that are useful for the uh, application domain. I uh, would say that uh, the, the conjecture is simply that by learning features that are specific to uh, a particular task, those features are going to be better than the features that we can maybe handcraft. My personal opinion, uh, and this is a little bit of a strong critique, is that all what we have done really with deep networks is to substitute handcrafted features by handcrafted architectures. Because uh, by and large, every progress that is made is by designing by hand and modifying, adding a new layer, adding a new shortcut connection, adding another nonlinearity. Uh, and uh, the question of how to design architectures uh, in a principled manner, I think remains fairly open. The second reason, uh, and this has become a hot topic today on the theory side as well, is uh, that more layers and bigger networks are better. Why is that the case? Uh, the first conjecture is that more layers capture more invariances. And this was a paper uh, in 2014 that you see here, the picture on the top right, where the X axis is the number of layers. The Y axis is the mean average precision in a computer vision task. And you see experimentally that more is uh, more layers is, is better. This has led to uh, key questions today, like over parametrization, that are uh, sort of changing the way in which we think about theory, because this is this goes against the intuition, right? We've always thought for a long time that we need to control the capacity of learning systems and not to overfit. And now we are in the opposite situation where bigger networks is better. But back in 2012, what was really the innovation? What changed between networks of the 1980s to the networks of the 2012? Uh, what really made the change in, in performance? So the only reason I think, it's really that there was more data. And because there was a lot more data, uh, one could, and more computing, uh, which goes hand in hand, one could train larger networks. And so it wasn't the case that there was any revolution or any great insight on a new optimization method or, or a new architecture design. No, it was really just big data, more computing that allowed us to, uh, to, to train them better. In terms of changes, the changes were relatively minor. Uh, one of those changes is this uh, new technique for training introduced in 2012 called dropout, uh, where rather than just following the gradient, uh, which would have been the classical back propagation algorithm, you uh, randomly select, say, half of the neurons, and you update the weights only of that half. And at the next iteration, you randomly select another half. So a little bit of a heuristics at first. The first time I heard about the dropout, I, I just didn't understand why it made sense and as, as an optimization algorithm. Uh, and so making sense of, of why these heuristics, and there are many others, right? There is dropout, there is batch normalization, there is short connection. There are so many heuristics that go into the design of successful networks. Why do they work? Why, why do they do things uh, better? Another change uh, was the introduction of these uh, rectify linear units. So it was very common in the networks of the 80s to use the blue curve as a nonlinearity. That's a sigmoid function. And it was replaced by ReLUs that are zero below a threshold and then the identity above the threshold. And when you ask the practitioners why uh, rectify linear units would be better or more appropriate, the typical answer was uh, the so-called uh, vanishing gradient problem. Uh, and what is meant by that is that for the blue curve, the gradient is zero uh, at the bottom, the gradient is zero at the top. And so the region where the gradient is non-zero is uh, very small. 
while for the red curve, uh, it is the identity in, in half of the space, and therefore uh, you expect that the vanishing gradient problem would disappear. That's potentially a good answer, but if you speak to someone who does optimization for a living, uh, they will tell you, well, I mean, non-vanishing gradient is not going to give me any guarantee of convergence or of optimality or, or avoiding local minima, nothing. And so the, the, the reason why a ReLU might be better than uh, a sigmoid, uh, it's, it's also very unclear. So uh, I think it's true uh, that at least until 2012, 13, 14, 15 or so, the theoretical understanding of, of deep networks uh, remained very shallow. And I think that's why there's been this huge investment and growth of the theoreticians and mathematicians trying to get into the understanding of neural networks. And the grant that Shankar mentioned is a great example of how the NSF and the Simons are investing heavily in this area with two very large projects uh, trying to figure it out. So what are the key areas in understanding the foundations of deep networks? The first one is how do we design architectures? How many layers, how many, uh, what kinds of anomalies? And the fundamental challenge is that this is done today uh, by hand or in a handcrafted manner. It is really driven by performance on a data set. Of course, we understand that convolution is good for images and, and but beyond, if I had a new application that was completely different from the usual ones, uh, I potentially would not know how to design the architecture. The second one is optimization. It is uh, expected that the, uh, the or, I mean, it's well known that the training problem is uh, non-convex. The number of variables, the number of weights can be say 60 million. So we are talking about a very high dimensional non-convex optimization problem. And so you would think I need very advanced and very sophisticated algorithms to, to tackle it. Uh, the practice has been that uh, by and large, you do first order methods. Uh, this is because of computational reasons. And uh, mysteriously, first order uh, methods seem to work, seem to work fine. Uh, even stochastic gradient descent methods seem to work fine. So uh, what is the landscape of the objective that makes uh, optimization easier? Uh, is it always the case? Or in fact, the, the, the common practice has been that this is the case for very large networks, very wide networks. Uh, and uh, so understanding the landscape remains a question, but also designing algorithms that are able to avoid saddle points, are able to avoid local minima and find global minimizers. And last but not least, and maybe the most important from a machine learning perspective is the question of generalization. Why is it the case that uh, these networks generalize so well as they do? And uh, why is it the case that if I make them bigger, uh, they uh, generalize better? So uh, what makes, I think, this area incredibly exciting is that in the past, in the, 2000, in the 2000s, for linear classification, we could separate these questions. We could say, well, the optimization problem for an SVM is convex. And so I can just uh, ask an expert in optimization to find the global minimum for me. Once I have it, I can ask an expert in learning to characterize why it generalizes well. But today, these three questions are uh, clearly interrelated. And so, uh, as I already mentioned, it could be the case that some architectures could be easier to optimize than others. And the practical wisdom is that bigger architectures are easier to optimize. Mm -hmm. It could also be uh, the case that uh, there is a relationship between architecture design and the generalization performance uh, of the network. And this has been pointed out in practice. Uh, but third, uh, there is also a relationship between optimization and generalization. And this is exactly what I was mentioning before. In the past, I could decouple them. Uh, but now, the, the, the fact that the optimization problem is non-convex means that there are many, potentially many global minimizers. So which one should I pick? Do they all generalize equally? Or is there one of the global minimizers that is better than the other from the perspective of generalization? And so the current belief is that this is the case, that there are some minima that are good and some minima that are not good. 
And the mystery is that depending on how you initialize, depending on which optimization method you pick, depending maybe even on the choice of the learning rate and maybe on the quality of your data, you end up converging to uh, different solutions. And the mystery is why for big networks trained with variants of stochastic gradient descent, it seems to be the case that you always find a minima that generalizes well. So there are many emerging theories uh, about why this, this is the case. And we had this fantastic workshop two weeks ago and I, did, uh, I gave a tutorial with a big overview of many of them. So today I'll just focus on, on the work that is emerging in my lab, uh, which is one potential theory. I, I don't want to be pretentious and claim that this is going to be the, the solution, but at least one uh, path which I'm proposing here uh, is that one way of understanding these three aspects, architecture, design, generalization, and optimization together within a unifying uh, principle is what I've highlighted here on the left. This word product of weights appears in three places. So what do I mean by that? The first bullet point says that if you choose one of the existing heuristics, namely dropout, even though it was proposed to be a heuristics, it's actually a valid method and it induces some form of regularization, namely automatically by modifying the optimization, you bias the algorithm to select some global minimizers versus others. And this bias is via extra regularization in the optimization problem. And the regularizer can be characterized analytically and it has the form of products of weights in the network. And I'll be much more explicit later in the talk about this. The second, and this is work by Nathan Zeribro at uh, TTIC, is that regularizers that are based on products of weights uh, have per, uh, bounds of generalization performance. And, and this is uh, the work of Nathan Zeribro, as I said. And third, and this actually will be the main point of this talk today, is that once you regularize networks with this product of weight regularizers, then optimization is easier and you can have guarantees of global optimality. And we've not made these three connections tight yet, and that's, so that's part of the future research, but if this conjecture holds true, the idea therefore would be that stochastic optimization techniques automatically induce regularization that both makes generalization better as well as optimization easier. And so that's the, the conjecture that I am trying to make here. So this talk uh, will have two main parts. The first one will ask the question uh, about optimization. What properties of the architecture and of the regularizers make optimization easier? And the answer that you see there on the left repeated is positive homogeneity. I will be showing that positively homogeneous network have very nice properties. In particular, I'll be showing that positively homogeneous networks uh, have the property that uh, if you're able to find a local minimum, and if this local minimum has such the property of redundancy, namely that if the network is sufficiently wide and the weights of one of the subnetworks are zero, then that is a certificate for global optimality. So in other words, local minima with zero weights are global minima. The second uh, main theorem uh, is that uh, if the network is sufficiently wide, uh, then you can find the global minimizers from any initialization using a meta algorithm. Many of the steps will be NP hard, but at least conceptually, the main point is that to traverse from any initialization to the global minimum, you don't need to increase the objective. And, and essentially this is simply saying that there is no local minima that is uh, global. That is not global, sorry. The second part of the talk will focus on the analysis of a specific optimization algorithm called dropout and extensions of dropout like drop connect and drop block. We will be asking questions such as, is this a heuristic or is it a valid optimization method? And the answer will be that it is a form of stochastic gradient descent. And it is a form of stochastic gradient descent, however, that changes the objective. So the objective 
uh, that dropout minimizes is different from your just unregularized loss, which is what people believe that dropout is doing. So that begs for the question, what is the regularization that dropout induces? And the answer is that it induces low rank regularization in the sense of learning networks that have the smallest number of neurons. So it is a form of capacity control, if you wish. The third question would be, what are the properties of optimal weights? And so we have shown that a dropout induces weights that are balanced. I've always had the conjecture, particularly with Shankar in the audience and being a controls person, that there is the area of balance realizations in controls. So uh, I think there will be an equivalent, I conjecture moving forward, of balanced networks. Uh, and essentially, the main point is that balanced networks have good generalization properties. That's my, my conjecture. And last but not least, uh, if I have the time, I'll show that even though these results, I'll, I'm mentioning them for dropout, uh, they actually extend to a variety of other regularization techniques, uh, including drop connect and drop block. And also they extend to some classes of uh, deep networks. So with that introduction, uh, let me get started with the first part of the talk. So uh, as I said, the main uh, result that I'll be showing is that if the network satisfies some properties, then uh, the optimization landscape is easier. So what are those properties on the architecture? And positive homogeneity is the first property. What does that mean? What it means is the following. Suppose that I begin with this uh, network uh, illustrated here at the top. Uh, and suppose that I would like to ask the following question. What happens if I scale the weights? So let me multiply the weights by alpha. And let me assume that the scale is non-negative, okay? So what I will require of the network architecture and of the nonlinearity is that the output also be scaled by alpha, but alpha to some power. And that's what we call the degree of homogeneity. So in other words, if phi denotes the input output map of the network, that in this particular case maps the network weights to the output, the idea is that if I scale uh, the network by alpha, then the output is also scaled by alpha to some power. Now, is this a magic property that I'm just requiring or is it too constraining or is it actually uh, very common and it already exists? So the answer is that it's, it's actually very common. Uh, let me illustrate with some very trivial examples here. So you have a linear network, you scale the input, uh, take a linear combination. So obviously uh, the output of that layer will be scaled by alpha. So the only interesting part of this trivial example is what happens with a rectified linear unit. And so if I scale the input of a ReLU by alpha, then uh, because the alpha is non-negative, this is not going to change which one of the two elements is the one that takes the maximum. So I can actually take the alpha outside so the, the main point, therefore, is that linear operations are obviously homogeneous, but ReLUs are also homogeneous, and the degree of homogeneity is one. And I emphasize again, and, and this is the justification for the word positive homogeneous, that this is only true for non-negative scalings. And this is exactly because of the ReLU. If the alpha was negative, this result will not be true. Okay? So anyhow, my, my first point is, linear layer plus a ReLU is homogeneous of degree one. So what about slightly more complex uh, network architectures like this one? So again, if I scale the weight of the first layer is convolution plus ReLU, so the alpha will come out. Let me now move to the second layer. I'm going to scale the weights of the second layer by alpha, but because the input was also scaled by alpha, what's going to pass through the network is an alpha square scale, okay? So the main point therefore is that every time I've got a linear plus ReLU, it, it scales by alpha. So another layer will become alpha squared. Let me try a different nonlinearity now, like max pooling. So suppose that in max pooling is a typical operation where uh, you take say a region of an image and you want to take the maximum response in a certain region. And so this in mathematics, this is just the maximum of a finite set of numbers here. 
So if every single number has been scaled by alpha squared, then uh, the maximum, uh, the alpha square can be taken outside the maximum. So it, the alpha square will pass the max pooling layer. And I guess I've bored you enough, right? If you keep doing this and this, the main point is a network with three layers has degree of homogeneity three. And more generally, uh, typically you will just increase the degree by one. So a network with a hundred layers will be homogeneous of degree 100. And this is true, you know, I've illustrated with trivial examples here, but it's true for many cases. Uh, and here's a list of uh, linear transformations followed by different nonlinearities and pooling operations for which this is true. I know, however, that this is not true for sigmoids. And so this is a first conjecture as to why ReLUs might be better than sigmoids. At least we will have guarantees of global optimality for ReLUs that we cannot obtain for uh, sigmoids. Okay, let me move to the second condition that we need to impose on the network. And it's this question of parallel subnetwork structure. So, uh, we will, uh, the results of global optimality will require that the network is obtained by composing many subnetworks in parallel. So here is one example. A subnetwork here is just a trivial, uh, is just one neuron, three inputs and two outputs. And then if I put many of them in parallel, then I get a network with a single hidden layer. So our global optimality results will be immediately applicable to uh, neural networks with a single hidden layer and with ReLU nonlinearity, which is one of the simplest and yet still commonly used architecture. A second, a little bit more involved example is pick any network that you want, uh, as long as it is positively homogeneous of some degree, whichever network you want, and then put many of them in parallel and add them up. So this is what we mean by having networks with a lot of parallel structure. Uh, as long as each subnetwork is homogeneous, uh, we will be fine. And again, I repeat that the idea is that is the subnetwork is the same. The weights could be different, but the architecture is not changing. So that is therefore a little bit of a restriction. So our results are maybe not fully practically applicable because not too many networks are designed in this form of putting many things in parallel with the exception of course of the single hidden layer network that I showed before. Though uh, if, if you're really familiar with this area and you know about dropout for example, uh, you would know that dropout is equivalent to training multiple networks in parallel and then averaging the results. So, uh, that's another conjecture that even though these results require these very wide architectures that may not really appear in practice, maybe actually they are appearing via dropout train, another conjecture. Uh, this is a final example, uh, just to, uh, you know, show that this can be fancy and really, uh, you know, pick any network you want. So here, what I did is pick many Alex nets. Uh, you modify the Alex net so that it is positively homogeneous, and then uh, this would be applicable to that case as well. Okay, so uh, that was the first, you know, in any theorem, if A and B happened, then you have a result. So these were the properties that I require in the architecture, positive homogeneity and parallel subnetwork structure. What are the conditions on the regularizers now? We will impose regularization on the weights. This is the classical regularizer that was used in the 80s, uh, L2 square regularization also used in classical list squares. Uh, and it's nothing fancy, it's the sum of the squares of the weights of the network. Uh, notice that obviously, this is obviously trivial, this is a degree two function. So it is homogeneous of degree two by construction. Uh, but uh, this regularizer is of degree two, but this network in particular that I'm showing in the figure would be homogeneous of degree three because it has three layers. I told you already that every layer adds one degree of homogeneity. And I want you to point out to the very uh, basic fact that two is different from three, uh, which is something really trivial, but nonetheless, it's actually important for our results. The fact that the degree of homogeneity of the network versus the degree of homogeneity of the regularizers disagree 
is a problem. And that's a source, it will be a source for spurious local mean. So a particular requirement that we impose on the regularizer is that we will require both the network to be homogeneous and the regularizer to be homogeneous, but we need them to be of the same degree so that there is some balance between the loss and the regularizer that allows the, the global optimality results to carry through. How can we design regularizers that are of the right degree for a network architecture? So this is the way we're gonna do it. So uh, on the left, you see the full architecture and the goal is come up with some regularizer. So the way we're gonna do it is, uh, let me begin with only one subnetwork and let me define some function of all the weights of that subnetwork that has the following properties. Uh, number one, it is positive definite. So theta is bigger than or equal to zero for every W. And it is homogeneous of the same degree. This is the same statement I made in the previous slide. What regularizer would have these properties? There are many that do, uh, but here is one that I want to point out. You take the norm or any norm for that matter of the weights of the first layer times any norm of weights for the second layer. And you do the product across all layers. There are five layers here. This will be homogeneous of degree five. And therefore it will match the degree of homogeneity of the network. And so that is exactly with this product of norms idea that I mentioned in the introduction emerges. That if you do take the products of norms of weights across the different layers, you will get automatically a regularizer whose degree is exactly equal to the degree of the network, which in this case is equal to five for a network with five layers. And then we will add them up. So the total regularizer is the sum of the regularizers uh, for each subnetwork. And the idea is that this is really a penalty for the size in that uh, the more subnetworks I get to add, the bigger the regularizer. So this is really going to be what does the capacity control. Uh, and R here is gonna be the number of subnetworks. And whenever I say the size of the network for these particular uh, architectures, it will be uh, the number of parallel subnetworks, okay? So in the framework, we're going to allow this R to vary uh, adding an extra subnetwork will be penalized by adding an extra regularization term. And in that way, we will be designing optimal architectures, if you wish, that not only minimize the loss, but also uh, penalize the number of subnetworks that get added in parallel. Okay, so with that uh, introduction, I've told you uh, what are the conditions on the architecture. I've told you what are the conditions on the regularizer. Let me now state formally uh, the theoretical results on global optimality. And I'm gonna do so uh, first on a simpler version of deep neural network training, which is just networks with a single hidden layer. And in that case, the training problem is really matrix factorization. And this is what I'm illustrating here. So I'll present first, therefore, uh, what are the conditions for global optimality for factorizing matrices, uh, and then go into the deep network case. So uh, what is matrix factorization and what are the theoretical results? Uh, the key uh, to everything that I'll be speaking is that I can always relate the neural network training problem that is non-convex to another problem that is convex. Uh, and the relationship between the two is the critical point that allows the theory to go through. In particular, let me compare these two problems. On the right, you have a matrix factorization problem, given a matrix Y, factorize it in terms of UV, plus some regularization. On the left, you have a convex version of it, where you uh, substitute UV transpose by X, and you have now some regularizer on X. And the problem on the left is convex because you typically choose the loss to be convex in X and you typically choose your regularizer to be convex on X. Think for example about uh, trace norm or nuclear norm regularization on X. So what is the relationship between the two problems in picture? 
this is the non-convex problem in your factorized space. What we're going to do is construct a problem on the product space on X that is guaranteed to be a global lower bound. And that's what I mean by a global lower bound. So F of X is always smaller than less than or equal to F of U comma V for UV matrices whose product is equal to X, but also it's tight. So the global minima of the function in the product space, which is convex, is equal to the global minima of the non-convex function. So that's going to be the intuition that will allow us the results. to. So the main question is, how do I construct, given the non-convex problem, how do I construct the convex one? And how do I construct it in a way that these properties are satisfied? So here's how the construction goes. And I'll do that for the particular case of the nuclear norm first. So what is the nuclear norm? If you've never heard about it, given a matrix X, its nuclear norm is simply the sum of the singular values of the matrix. So trivial, highly used, any method on robust PCA or matrix completion, many machine learning techniques have relied for 10 years on uh, regularizing with the nuclear norm. It turns out that you can write this nuclear norm, uh, which is very simple, in a very fancy and complicated way, as I've written here. Uh, you begin with a matrix X on the far right. You factorize it in terms of U and V. And uh, the factorization is not unique. There are many pairs of U and V whose product is equal to X. Among all of those, select the one that minimizes this regularizer. What is this regularizer? Is the sum from one to R. R here denotes the number of columns of U and V. And this is the norm of the ith column times the norm of the ith column. In the neural network case, V is going to be the input weights. U is going to be the output weights. And U sub I is going to be the weight of the ith neuron. And similarly for V sub I. So this is exactly sum of products of weights where the sum is across the neurons. And R is going to be exactly the number of neurons in that hidden layer. In the matrix factorization case is the number of columns. In a neural network is the number of neurons. Okay. So um, this result, I've written it here for uh, nuclear norm. And notice the mysterious choice uh, of norm of U is the two norm. For the norm of V is the two norm. But this result, uh, so this is exactly the regularizer that we're going to choose uh, in the non-convex problem. So in other words, we will use uh, a regular, so we will uh, take the, the loss function, we will augment it with a regularizer that is sum of products of weights. And when we do that, we will achieve, because of this theorem, the fact that it will be lower bounded by the convex problem on the left and the bound will be tight, okay? Now, these results can be extended to many other norms. And in fact, they can be extended to any gauge function or any positively homogeneous function. I'm illustrated here with norms just because it's simpler, but these results are very general. So now I can state uh, the first theoretical result for matrix factorization. This result says, if you give me a loss function that is convex and once differentiable, Let's say that you're trying to uh, solve this matrix factorization problem or train this neural network with a single hidden layer. If you can find the local minimum for that problem and that local minimum happens to have the property that one column of I and one column of V are zero. In other words, if all of the weights of one neuron are zero, that is a certificate uh, of global optimality. In other words, a network trained such that uh, if you find a local minimum with the property that all of the weights of one neuron are zero, that local minimum is global. And moreover, and this is what makes the connection with the convex problem tight, is that V product of U and V gives a global minimum for the convex problem. Uh, and I hope that this makes the result a little bit more precise. I want to note also that this satisfies everything I said about neural networks. UV transpose matrix multiplication is homogeneous of degree two. 
uh, the regularizer that I have here, sum of product to weights, is homogeneous of degree two. So it's in the parallel structure is because I've got this sum of one to the number of neurons. So all of the ingredients that I mentioned about deep networks, this is a particular case um, that illustrates it all. Since I'm running a little late, uh, let me skip now to immediately how we extend this to uh, neural networks. Okay, so how do we go from the simple matrix factorization case to the deep network case? So the key to everything was this parallel structure that I mentioned a couple of times. So in the case of matrix factorization, the parallel structure is across the neurons or across the columns. And it is simply because, as you know from basic linear algebra, UV transpose can be decomposed as the sum over columns. So UV transpose is the sum from one to the number of columns of UI VI transpose. So the reason for this construction of neural networks with parallel structure and adding them up is really replicating this matrix multiplication. The overall input output map of the network, capital Phi, is the sum from one to the number of parallel subnetworks of the input output map of an individual subnetwork. And so what is matrix factorization? Is simply the case of uh, a single hidden layer and no nonlinearities. That's 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 all. But this phi map, I hope you appreciate now, is the generalization of outer products. And therefore, if this phi map is a tensor product, our results apply to tensor factorization. If the phi map is uh, convolution plus nonlinearity uh, with a ReLU, for instance, they will apply to deep networks. Okay, so this is the first part. How do we extend the uh, matrix factorization part of the theorem. The second part is how do we extend the regularization part of the theorem? So in the matrix factorization case, uh, I already explained it. This comes from the nuclear norm. And all what I said was, give me a matrix Z, factorize it, and then among all possible factorization, choose the one that minimizes the sum of products of weights. We're going to do identically the same, but for deep networks. So again, I begin here on the far right with the output to that big network. And the output to that big network must be equal to phi of the weights. Okay, So given a set of weights, I produce some output. But because the network is big and overparametrized, there will be many weights that give rise to the same identical output in the same way that in matrix products, I have many pairs of U and V that give rise to the same C. So among all, all of those weights who's, uh, that give the same output, I will choose the weights that minimize some uh, regularization function, homogeneous of degree K, as I mentioned earlier. The sum of product of weights example is one such example, but the theta here can be really anything as long as it's homogeneous of the same degree. And when I minimize uh, this regularizer over the network weights, it gives a function of the output because of, the, 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 because of this constraint here, that the phi of the weights must be equal to the output. So this omega of z that I get at the very end, um, well, what kind of function is it? Before, it was a nuclear norm. Now, it's a very fancy and complicated thing, uh, but actually, it's not that complicated. Uh, it, uh, it is a function that is positively homogeneous, but the remarkable fact is that this function is convex. Even if your network is nonlinear, even if you have non-convexity, even if your regularizer is non-convex, if you minimize this with respect to the weights, and if they're homogeneous of the same degree, then the minimum as a function of the output is convex. So that's exactly what I sort of articulated uh, earlier at the beginning. Uh, and so with that, I can finally state the main result uh, of the talk here, which is that in training a neural network, uh, if the loss is convex and differentiable on the second argument, which is the output of the network, if the network is homogeneous, uh, if the regularizer is homogeneous, if they're homogeneous of the same degree, then if you find a local minimum for the weights 
And the local minimum is such that all of the weights of one of the subnetworks are zero. Then that local minimum is guaranteed to be global. That's what the first part of the theorem says. And the second part says that in addition, the output of the network for, you know, you give me those weights and I can evaluate now the output. The output of that network is the global minimum of a convex problem. And the convex problem is really a convex problem that really directly minimizes the loss on the output plus this fancy induced regularizer uh, that on the output that is induced from, from the weights. And I did really mention this earlier already. Uh, there are many, 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 the framework is very general, many particular cases. So matrix factorization is one, tensor factorization is another, and deep learning is another. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, the, what I wanted to say is uh, the, the big messages are the following. Uh, when it comes to optimization for deep networks, uh, bigger networks seems to be easier to optimize. And this talk in particular highlighted the fact that wide networks are easier to optimize and that networks whose size is above some threshold, you can have guarantees of global optimality. In this talk, the size was measured in terms of number of parallel sub networks. So extending this framework to various different notions of size, like how many layers, how many neurons per layer is, is part of the future work. The second big message is that this is achieved by using explicit regularization. Uh, and the explicit regularization here controls the size of the network and positive homogeneous regularizers are needed and they need to be of the same degree of, of the network. Now, the challenge is that uh, Everything I talked about is landscape. It tells you that optimization should be easier, at least from the perspective of local minima that are not global, they disappear when the size is large enough. But I did not talk about algorithms. So in moving forward, uh, the algorithms that emerge of this framework, many aspects could be in hard. So building regularizers that are tractable uh, is, is one of the uh, tasks moving forward. So uh, with that in mind, uh, let me uh, stop there. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them now. Fantastic. That is a wonderful talk. Let's see, there are some questions. Uh, let's see, shall we <coughs> go to the top? There's a number of questions about what does it mean? What does positive homogeneity mean? What does it mean for subnetworks to be homogeneous? A couple of questions on this regard. I see. Uh, so uh, I guess it's um, not the definition. I think uh, maybe what the implication is could be the question. I think judging from what yes. You know. Yes, 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 yes. So the definition, I, I hope it was clear. Uh, it simply means. Um, it, if you wish, is an extension of linearity. Homo homogeneous of degree one is the same thing as linear uh, in various ways. Uh, what are the implications? Um, I don't think I know or I could answer what are all the implications. The, the intuition behind it is, is does not go too much beyond what I said, which is that if you scale the weights, the output is scaled. Um, but in a sense, this is uh, somewhat constraining the type of nonlinearities that you use to make them uh, more amenable. And there are many uh, properties that, that emerge from that, but uh, it's very hard to, to, discuss, to discuss them at a, at a level that is just purely intuitive. I mean, if, if I had to argue intuitively, why is it the case that positive homogeneity leads to the disappearance of local minima, I, I couldn't argue at an intuitive level, uh, other than you go th through the mathematics and, and that's what emerges. Uh, what There's is another question maybe, here. Maybe if I could explain it with, uh, maybe if I could explain it with only one level of intuitiveness. Um, convexity uh, is somewhat connected to positive homogeneity. So when you talk about convexity, you, uh, you begin uh, by showing that the function on a convex combination is less than or equal to 
the convex combination of the function values. Uh, be, the, the fact that the, that the network is possibly homogeneous is critical to getting that convexity result. Uh, let me stop there. The second set of questions is about why does, uh, why do you need larger networks to get at the properties? And the question that I didn't catch why larger network required properties in this paper. Yes. Um, let me explain that intuitively with the matrix factorization case. Uh, ultimately, the intuition is uh, that the global minimum, let's say, is low rank. Let's say that the global minimum had rank five. So if you use um, networks that have variable size and the size is bigger than five, there is redundancy in capturing that global optimum. And the fact that some of the columns are zero is really a reduction of the rank to match the rank of the global optimum. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, did we lose you, Renee? Okay, there you are back. Okay. Uh, another set of questions. Do you know anything about the functional form of the regularizer implied by the results at the end of the talk? Uh, I don't also fully understand how, what the question do you understand? So, do you know anything about the functional form of the regularizer? I presume yes. that was that phi of y comma yes. v. So, yes, so the functional form of the regularizer uh, on the yeah. output yeah. is a function of both the functional form of the regularizer on the weights and the network architecture and nonlinearities. For simple cases, like the matrix factorization case, as well as the L2 regularizers, we get the nuclear norm. That was the example that I gave. If instead of the L2 norms, you choose L1, uh, you are going to get some form of L1. If you choose L infinity, then you... So uh, the, the regularizer can be characterized in closed form only in some special circumstances. And I am not suggesting that we optimize with this uh, regularizer on the output. The main message is that knowing that it exists and knowing that it convex facilitates the analysis of the non-convex problem. But, and I concluded my talk with that comment, uh, designing regularizers that allow for that, uh, uh, designing regularizers on the weights that induce regularizers on the output that are easier to optimize is future work. Mm. This is a complicated question, which I'm going to try to parse. Uh, I think there's a bunch of uh, practitioners trying to use uh, deep networks to understand the amino acid sequences associated with uh, COVID-19. And the question from Tatiana is to ask you if you have had any work on applying your algorithms to detecting changes in the amino acid sequences and COVID-19, maybe, maybe just about what happens when you apply the theorems to applications. I would be interested in actually you in hearing about the applications and vision or what, you know, what happens when you apply them. That would be interesting. Yes. Um, so I, I don't work in computational genomics, so I've not applied uh, these results to these type of problems. I do work in computer vision and medical imaging. Uh, and so that would be an area that I'm more familiar with. Uh, Relating to COVID in particular, uh, I've not done the work, but I have a colleague at Hopkins, uh, Jeremiah Sulam, who has been using deep networks uh, for analyzing CT scans of the lungs uh, with the purpose of uh, detecting uh, with, with whether a patient has COVID and, and also the growth of the region that has been affected. Uh, those type of network architectures are primarily sort of segmentation style architectures in uh, computer vision, in particular, those that have been successful in medical imaging is the so-called UNET. Um, whether the theoretical results that I've presented apply to something like a UNET, uh, no. Uh, the reason being the following. Uh, UNETs, for example, have shortcut connections. Uh, 
as, as you know. And the shortcut connection sort of resets the degree of homogeneity because once you put a shortcut, that's uh, sort of degree one. And if you do a shortcut across three layers, you would be adding a degree one with a degree three. So mm -hmm. that's opening up uh, a future research on the theory side, which is how do you deal with say rest nets, uh, which are architectures that do have those uh, reset connections. Um, I, I think, uh, Rene, I think certainly, you know, this one thing we have seen in this seminar series is, you know, this technique that they use for scoring CT scans, which is uh, a common thing that they do, is really terrible. I think it is really in need of uh, some uh, deep learning. Actually, there are some investigators in, uh, in this thing from University of Chicago we're thinking about this. So I think it'd be very, very interesting to apply your methods to this scoring of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, great images at uh, Hopkins, but any, anyhow. So it's, uh, let, let me uh, conclude with this one more question I want to get to. So one, well, this last question says, if I'm getting this right, you propose an explanation of why neural networks optimize well. And you hinted that similar assumptions on the architecture and uh, regularizer lead you to a good generalization. How so? That's the uh, question. So may maybe this just gives you a chance to reiterate to how you began the talk. That was great. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I was maybe going too slowly or overly ambitious on, on the length of the talk. But the second part that I didn't get to speak about was uh, the regularization properties of dropout. Um, and over there, I was going to show that dropout induces a regularizer that is exactly sums of product weights and therefore sort of tie. Uh, uh, and this was what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that if you use something like dropout that will induce sums of products of weights, those sums of product of weights have good regularization properties. And because of the first part of the talk, the one that I did present, they do have good optimization properties. So I didn't get to tie them all and, and happy to explain that in more detail, but it would require me several minutes if I wanted to go through the dropout stuff. All right, I have to say that was a wonderful stimulating talk and it's uh, sort of amazing that uh, in your last slide about how many special cases it applies to really wonderful, wonderful, stimulating talk. So thank you very much, Rene, for a great talk. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Shankar. And thank you, Shrikant. And congratulations thank on the great thank you. to you, Rene. Thank you. Bye.